This is a meeting of an organization of progressive electors, uh, and I'm going to talk about municipal socialism. How many of y'all are socialists? Okay, so we don't need to pretend. It's an irony, but a useful one in the sense that the first breakthrough for socialism took place at the municipal level. It took place in Paris in 1871 with the Paris Commune. And even though the Paris Commune aspired to greater things, it was ultimately a municipal regime. And a number of the measures it passed, in fact, are useful today in looking at municipal politics. One of the things it did was it said that no employee of the commune should earn more than a skilled worker. This is, remains to be implemented almost 150 years later. It also said that bread would be ready an hour later so that bakers could sleep in till 3.30. And um, this, too, was an important reform. Uh, and in fact, in terms of educating yourself on municipal uh, activities, read Marx and Lenin on the commune. It's fascinating stuff. But the point of what we're talking about, I think, is not revolution, but rather reform. Um, so in that context, I don't want to discuss Petrograd in 1905 or 17. I don't want to talk about Barcelona in 1936, 1937, even though those are amazing experiences in cities. And I don't even want to look at more contemporary events like the Water War in Cochabamba in 2000, or the socialist regime today in the small Spanish town of Marina Leda in Andalusia. Even they're useful though they are useful. What I'd like to talk briefly about is to look at major cities in mainly advanced capitalist countries over 100 years or so and how municipal governments and politicians of the left have been able to enact important reforms because I think those situations are much closer to our reality than a number of others. It's a brief overview. I suggest those of you who are interested do some research. There's a lot of material out there. I want to start with the general approach, which is what do municipalities control? Housing, health, utilities, education, culture, social services. Those are the main things that municipalities can get their hands on. And while passing resolutions to make cities nuclear free are useful and important things and other general symbolic things, what affects most are things that impact on their daily lives. And those areas are in fact what has characterized, have characterized municipal governments over the last hundred years or so. Is this a reformist? in terms of making modest reforms in the way that capitalism operates? Yes, it is. Um, should we dismiss working for these reforms while not losing sight of the big picture of radical societal change? No. If you thought that, you wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be talking about what can be done at the municipal level. The left has had power in the electoral sense at the municipal level in Vancouver and in Virons a few times in recent memory. What it did with that would be an interesting discussion. What it should do if it gets another chance is even a more interesting discussion. With that in mind, I want to look very superficially at a few, what a few of our ideological sisters and brothers have done in the past. I want to start with an unusual place. You wouldn't think that the place to begin looking at socialist municipal politics is Milwaukee, but it is. Milwaukee was inhabited by many working class German immigrants, a number of whom were 48ers, i.e. people who'd fought in the uprising of 1848. Karl Marx thought about moving to the United States at one point, and he wrote for American socialist newspapers. Milwaukee was a center of municipal socialism. The goal was to mitigate the impact of the Industrial Revolution through sanitation, through municipally owned water and power, community parks, education of children and workers. 
This was the era of the muckrakers, journalists who denounced the condition of workers. Who here has read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle? Well, you ought to. Um, which describe those conditions. This also made it an era of reform. The Progressive Party fought for reforms, but on the left, the socialists wanted to do more than mitigate the worst excesses of capitalism, but they also believed change would come through elections and that running governments that improved conditions and were efficient and honest would lead to the glorious day when people would wise and upvote for them and change everything. So many of these German socialists, Robert Schilling, uh, Victor Berger, the Stan Austrian, the standard bearer, I see somebody who knew Victor, no? <laughs> um, the first mayor, first socialist mayor in the United States, uh, Emil Seidel, elected in 1910 with a socialist majority on city council in Milwaukee, and they began changing things. The brothels were closed, municipal services were expanded, the minimum wage for city workers was raised. They tried to do even other things, better public schools, more public parks. They say that Milwaukee still has the best parks of any city in the United States. You're shaking your head. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but um, more and bigger public libraries, better public health, cleaning up open sewers and all this. These were concrete measures taken by a socialist municipal government in Milwaukee. Um, they wanted public ownership of utilities and all kinds of other things that they never got. But what they did do was set in place a tradition of honest, efficient, frugal, governments with concern for the working class. And the result was continued success at the polls that went on right up until 1960, when the last socialist mayor, Frank Zeidler, um, was not re-elected. At the same time, in another city, Paris, you began to see the Red Belts, the Cordon Rouge, they were a function of two things. One, they were a function of the Commune of Paris and its defeat when the bourgeoisie widened the streets and got rid of the slum with the little streets so they could shoot the cannon down the big street and move horses and artillery up and down to crush the workers. And the second was expelling the workers from the center of Paris. So you had this belt to the north and to some degree of the south, places like Ivry, Saint-Denis, Bobigny, where a million workers settled, um, partially because there was air, there was sunshine, they could have houses, and they could have their little allotments where they could grow things, many of them being only a generation or two out of the country. Um, these areas, which are now mainly cited as the location of disenfranchised Muslim youth uh, are still in many cases governed by Communist Party-led city councils that go back to the Socialist Party and then the Communist Party in 1918, particularly to 1939, when they were inhabited by a million workers governed by the Socialist Party or the Communist Party. And they practiced a more radical politics in Milwaukee. In the period between World War I and World War II, they worked both for practical reforms and to raise consciousness. So in Saint-Denis, they built a swimming pool, a library, daycare, schools, summer camps. But meanwhile, in Bobigny, 1925, when the Communist Party called for a one-day strike in solidarity with the Moroccan independence fighters in the Rift Mountains, Monsieur Clamamous, or Comrade Clamamous, the mayor of Bobigny, closed City Hall and gave city workers a day off, encouraging them to go to the demonstration. In 1934, their electoral platform declaimed, we oppose to the general interests of capital, the interests of the workers against those of their exploiters. They used to have red baptisms to replace Catholic baptisms under the slogan, priests to the lampposts, death to Christmas. Um, they changed the street names. Louise Michel, the communist activist, has a street there. Sacco and Vanny, Vanzetti have streets there. There's Rue Moscow, there's Rue Leningrad, an attempt to 
change consciousness. I've always wondered when Cope had political power in Vancouver, why we didn't get rid of Dunsmuir and rename it Goodwin for Christ's sake. Wouldn't it cost much? <laughs> you can drive through these suburbs today and you know where the right is in power because you'll see Rue John Kennedy. And where the left is in power, you'll see Rue Maurice Torres, the historical leader of the Communist Party. Again, modest social reforms combined with trying to raise political and cultural consciousness. Perhaps the best example of these was what was called Red Vienna between 1918 and 1934. The biggest and most ambitious of the socialist municipal projects. In this period, the government of the city, which was social democratic, not communist, built 400 apartment buildings with 64,000 new apartments to house 10% of the population of the city. These buildings brought to life some of the utopian vision of socialism. Interior courtyards with kindergartens, playgrounds, maternity clinics, health clinics, libraries, communal laundries, and a variety of other social services. They really tried it to build paradise on earth to the best of their abilities. The best known and still there was the Karl Marx Hof where visionary buildings were created by some of the world's foremost architects of the day. And they were paid for by the Vienna housing tax and the Vienna luxury tax. In a sense, they made the rich pay for the accommodation of the poor. Every child in Vienna got a clothes package when they were born so that the socialist government would declare no child in Vienna has to be wrapped in newspaper. The City Council for Social Services and Health said, we spend for youth homes what we spend for youth homes we will save on prisons. What we spend on the care of pregnant women and babies we will save in hospitals. TB fell by 50%. So it is no accident that when the far right seized power in 1934 and the socialist workers resisted, the right gleefully shelled the Karl Marx Hof with heavy artillery and a gesture of their hatred for what the workers had won. In Italy, in the aftermath of the Second World War, Bologna became a red beacon, as did Emilia, Reggio Emilia in the state, same thing of Emilia Romagna. Between 46 and 56, the municipal government of Bologna, a center of partisan activity, built nine schools, 896 apartments, 31 nursery schools, 8,000 children received subsidized school, mill, school meals, there were new drains, municipal laundrettes, street lighting, public transport, health care, etc., etc. And in all these years, and again, this is part of this logic which goes back to Paris and also to Milwaukee, they are proudly, they are proud of the fact that the city council never ran a deficit. In Reggio Emilia, a little far further up the highway from Bologna, there's a series of schools, there's an entire program called the Reggio Emilia approach. Anybody ever heard of it? Well, if you're in education, you would have. It's called, it talks about the hundred languages of children. In their 19 municipal preschools and 13 infant care centers, they, which have been judged by Newsweek magazine, which, there you go, for what it's worth, the best in the world, they have created a whole new series of approaches to educating children, more than any other Italian city of its size. Elderly city, citizens are offered a full range of care, municipal nursing homes, daycare centers, home monitors, hot meals, two-week subsidized trips to the mountains. All these things are municipal policies that have been set in place by socialist municipal governments that have control over these things. You're entitled to ask, this, and the question is posed, is this a result of socialized ideas? are good administrators who happen to be socialists, and that's a debate around, around these things. In the 60s, which I don't have time to talk about, five minutes, thanks, 
You have examples in Berkeley, Amsterdam, and Copenhagen, where the kind of left met the counterculture and produced some interesting things. In London, in the 80s, you had Red Ken Livingston and the GLC, the Greater London Council, which enacted a number of measures very similar to those enacted in Milwaukee, those enacted in Paris, those enacted in Bologna, et cetera, a series of municipal reforms that deal with things like transportation, daycare policy, maternity, medical, all those things that cities have control over. In Porto Alegre, in Brazil, they developed the participatory budget, the idea of mobilizing citizens to meet in rooms like this and say, OK, what are we going to do with the money? This kind of popular participation is something that's new and something that's important. In Mexico City, which is a federal district, you have same-sex marriage is legal, abortion is legal, marijuana has been decriminalized, and there are pensions. This does not exist in Mexico. But because the city has the power to enact these things, because it's a federal district, it does exist in Mexico City, where a part, the parties of the left are in power. And there are signs in front of construction projects that say, this is what a government of the left looks like. Finally, I want to close with Seattle. Very close and very recent. In 2013, a single socialist activist, a woman who comes out of a small Trotskyist organization called Socialist Alternative named Kashama Savan, um, ran a campaign to get herself elected to Seattle City Council. The central plank of that campaign was a $15 an hour minimum wage. She won. She didn't win by much, but you don't need to. She won. She got elected. As a result of the support for her campaign, the mayor, six months later, announced the increase to $15 an hour in Seattle. The business press is up in arms. They claim restaurant jobs. You know, by the sound of it, if you go to Seattle, there's nothing to eat because every restaurant closed because they couldn't afford $15. But the fact of the matter is that it has made a fundamental material difference to many, many people. Her platform advocates a whole series of other things, bike ways, an end to racial profiling by the police, the end of user fees for municipal services, better public transit. Some of those demands going back 100 years, some of those demands fairly recent. Even though these need more than one socialist on council, the very fact that somebody is speaking out for radical reforms is a prod and is an asset and demonstrates what you can do. So there's a lot of experience out there for folks who are interested in both socialism and municipal politics. I recommend you study the experiences, learn from them, and steal the best ideas so that if there is an opportunity, they can be implemented. Thank you.